Greetings ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the definitive Star Drive Black Box Combined Arms Guide. The purpose of this video is to do an in-depth tutorial on the mechanics of the new improved Star Drive, showing off the extremely fine work of Country Gremlin's team of Black Box and Fitzban's team of Combined Arms. Two mods working in tandem that rehaul the game almost completely from the ground up. So please check out the timestamps below to see important details. To begin, let's talk about a little history. Star Drive began its life as a Kickstarter campaign in 2011, where the creator and solo developer Daniel Zero DeKaiko, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, hosted the game and ended up raising $10,000 above its crowdfunded goal, with everyone backing excited about a new 4X game that was a real-time strategy no less. It promised a host of features from race customization, ground combat, and robust ship designer, and plenty of other features, most of which have made into the game. Then come 2013, Star Drive was released to mixed reviews, with some of the consumer base really enjoying the game, stating how much they enjoy the space RTS aspect and ship customization, others however complaining how the game is buggy and incomplete, leading to a fractured audience. But during that same year of 2013, the modern community came down from on high to bless Star Drive. Enter the Black Box mod, initiated by Crunchy Gremlin, but also co-developed by Red Fox and Fat Bastard slash Vitzban. The modding team has taken it upon themselves to fix as many bugs and issues as possible in a game they're most passionate about. Fixes that Black Box includes many crash fixes, many fixes to weapon effects, fixes to weapon targeting, more multi-threading, and many, many more. While Black Box was in full swing in 2013, so were other mods being released, from Tim's mod to Star Trek to many others. However, the vast majority of mod development ceased in 2015, and those mods mentioned earlier are no longer available for download, have been lost to the wilds of the internet, except for Black Box, which was still ongoing. But also in March 2015, Fitzban changed that. He released the combo mod, then updated it to combined arms mod in 2017, which is a massive mod pack designed for black box that takes the best from other discontinued mods while adding its own flair. It adds a new race, 118 additional ship hulls, all faction unique, from fighter halls to new massive titan hull, and a fleshed out tech tree featuring new weapons, armors, shields, colonization buildings, most in very high resolution textures might I add. Nice. These two mods together form a powerful tag team, bring fresh new features and reworking old ones, becoming the definitive community patch mods. And there's no signs of the mod teams from stopping, as a team just released Black Box Venus and is now working on Mars, continuing mod development for Star Drive. So, if you're interested in Star Drive Black Box Combined Arms, you can get the base game for cheap at G2A for as little as $5, or feeling extra spicy, buy it on Steam. And there'll also be an installation guide on Black Box and Combined Arms linked down below as well. With all that being said, let's continue with the definitive Star Drive Black Box Combined Arms tutorial with a new game. So currently there are nine races to choose from in Star Drive Black Box CA from the skittish Cordrazine here, which are space mollusks that rule over the space owls here, to the honorable Kularathi, which are samurai sword bears in space naturally to the sentient plant people which are friendly little plants that just want to be friends and hang out and sing in the sun that sort of thing until you get on their bad side of course and then down at the very bottom here we have the dauntless which is the modified race included in black box ca they are basically a ruthless um corporate race of humans that just like to prowl the galaxy and cause trouble for everybody and like every other forex game out there you can edit the traits of an empire once you sort of select it what you see here is the base traits sort of tied to the empire but you can change it so if you don't like the race being very smart you can just select that and you'll have three extra points to spend on the physical qualities of a race the sociological qualities of a race or the historical and traditional qualities of a race if you so choose I think for this race, the Dauntless, I think I will keep them at smarts, give them, uh, keep them smart, because uh, getting an extra bonus to research efforts is obviously a very good thing, I would think. 
Also in the top left corner here, you can see these environmental preferences. This is included in the black box uh, CA mod. Actually, I think it's actually only included in CA. Now, what will happen is each race will have a preference to their environment, obviously. So when the Dauntless colonize a Terran world, they will gain a 1.5 times bonus to the fertility efforts of a planet. And fertility is directly tied to food production, which is directly tied to survival. So that's very good for the Dauntless. Same logic is applied to other races here. Each one has an environment that they prefer over all others, so consider that when choosing a uh, race, okay? But for this tutorial, I'll be using the Dauntless for my example race. And now once we pick our race here, we want to go to our galaxy size here. So we can click the galaxy right here. We go all the way up to truly epic. Uh, this is brand new to black box this wasn't included in the base game and as you can see on the right here it'll even tell you the solar systems uh, that you'll have for that galaxy which is a quite a massive amount 140 you can even increase it even more by just adding more solar systems up to super packed and get an extra <laughs> up to 252 uh, planets that's quite impressive Increase the amount of opponents that you'll get all the way up to eight. You can even change the game modes uh, to capital elimination, sandbox, small clusters, big clusters, corners, that sort of thing. Change the difficulty. Every time you change the difficulty, um, the AI will gain uh, bonuses that you won't receive. So greater research rates, that sort of thing. You can change the remnant presence as well. So the remnants uh, for Star Drive are a race of guardians that will protect highly valuable worlds. And you can increase the presence for each of those valuable worlds. So you can make the make it so <laughs> they're pretty much everywhere. Would not recommend if it's your first time playing Star Drive. Uh, just keep it at normal. So once you sort of select your galaxy, you can go to rule options here if you so choose. And you can select the in-system FTL, in-system FTL for enemies, the gravity wells, the extra planets, starting planet richness bonus, all sorts of things here. Um, I'm going to set the extra planets down to zero just for performance sake. And I'm also just going to bring it down to maybe a small galaxy size and set it to normal and set my opponent to one here with a difficulty of normal as well just for tutorial purposes actually i might even set it to easy just for <laughs> just for my sake here so now that we've established our race we established the traits we established the rules and we established the galaxy size the next final step is just to click engage so now we'll get into that now Alright, so here we are in game, but before we begin anything, it's a good idea to pause your game with the spacebar so you can get your bearings and to stop the game from going through turns. Turns in Star Drive mean that every 5 real time seconds will equal 1 turn in game. You can increase this rate with the numpad plus key or decrease it with the numpad minus key. With that being said, however, in this part I'll be guiding you through the game on what's on your screen here as well as some tips on how to start your game properly. Let us begin with looking at our economy overview screen in the top left here. Just going to click on that. Now let's talk about taxes. So taxes are a percentage of your empire's population's income, which is taxed. This taxed income goes into your treasury, treasury being right here, which in turn goes into the construction of ships, certain buildings, deep space platforms, stations, rushing production of ships and buildings, ship upkeep, building upkeep, playing off pirates and hiring spies. You can increase the tax rate all the way up to 100%, but there will be repercussions for doing so. For instance, by having a higher tax rate, your empire will lose the rate of mineral production and research rates for planets. However, if your empire does lose all of its money in its treasury, you're in the negative now, that will lead to the population rebelling against you, so you do not want that. With that being said, let us talk about treasury goals now. So the intention of treasury goals is to allow the game to automatically oversee the finances of your empire with two somewhat separated systems. The first system is auto tax. 
Auto tax is quite easy to activate. Setting your treasury goals, then clicking on auto tax will have the game automatically increase or decrease the tax rate over a 20 turn period. Turns again being every five real time seconds until the auto tax has reached its treasury goal. The second system applies to governor budgets, which doesn't need auto tax activated in order to work, but needs to have a treasury goal set in order to function. Governors, for those who don't know, are planetary overseers that automatically watch over the production, construction, and defense on a planet upon which they're established, and they use the governor budgets to do so. We'll get more into governors in a different section here. So going to our income right now, we're going to talk about the other. So other differs to when spies steal from enemy empires, steal in the treasuries, and it also differs to when you find credits from anomalies, both of which we'll get into in a later section, but that's the rough idea for the other, okay? So now we're going to talk about excess goods. Excess goods is a new mechanic introduced by the black box mod that quite simply put is when a planet's storage of either food or material has reached maximum capacity and is now producing an overabundance of goods. The extra goods produced is then converted into extra credits for your empire based off of the amount of production produced after the storage is full. So, for example, if a plant's material production is set at, say, plus 20 production per turn after storage is full, it will yield a greater excess good amount in credits than if a planet's allocated production was set at plus 10 after the storage is full. So that's what excess goods are deferring to there. So let's talk about trading next. So quite simply, trading defers to when you want to trade or is being requested to trade by other empires. Trading starts, starts off small, but ramps up over time to a max of plus three credits per turn. We'll get more into dealing with empires in a later section. And then mercantilism defers to when you have upgraded or sorry, unlocked a certain research path that once unlocked will give the player a portion of credits based off of the tax rate from every unit of food or production found around within or outside your empire. So for example, if we were transporting 10 units of production and our tax rate was set at 10%, we would receive one credit when transporting goods. Okay, so let's talk about expenditures here. This is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, buildings will have a maintenance cost to them. So you'll have to consider upkeep for your buildings. Ships will also have a maintenance cost. And production fees refer to uh, the fees as the building or the ship is being constructed. So there'll be certain fees tied to that. So that is everything in the economy overview screen here. So... At this point, what I like to do, uh, the auto tax has kind of established it for me, but let's say we were starting the game at 25%. What I like to do is set it down to zero. Now, what that will do is decrease our treasury over time, but it will also maximize the research gains per turn than we would otherwise have if we were to set it at 25%. Now, the reason why I want it set at zero and to gain to... Um, maximize the research gains is because I want to be able to unlock as many things as I can as quickly as possible which brings us to the next point the research tree here research screen I should say so let's get into that now so here we are inside the research screen it is here where you'll be unlocking new technologies as you progress through the game and as you can see in sharp contrast with their original games research screen versus combined arms is you'll see the combined arms is research screen is a lot more fleshed out and complete i feel a lot of new buildings to play with for your perusal we got brand new armors to play with in the original all you really got was a steel armor and palace steel and that was it and a few um shields right here but as you can see a lot more to choose from for your convenience brand new energy weapons to play with all the way up to uh, an, a mark II version of the disintegrator arrays you get assault disintegrators now they absolutely rip through everything you can even get quantum cannons 
gravitons it's all there for you to use all very exciting i would think you even get brand new guided weapons in the original star drive i think all the only guided weapons you got was these two this rocket launcher this missile launcher and this one shadow storm and this one conventional torpedo tube but as you can see a lot more options here all the way up to say tactical nukes so now you can equip your ships with tactical nukes now you can even get lrms that shoot across the map it's all very much fleshed out isn't it going down to physics now just to show it off a bit more you can even create fighter bombers that bomb say capital ships so if you ever have the fantasy of creating say a star wars sort of anti-capital bomber you can now do so and equip it with uh, plasma bombs for your convenience there you even get plasma weapons plasma torpedoes antimatter torpedoes heavy antimatter cannons that sort of thing you can even get these high pressure plasma throwers which are like flamethrowers in space it's all very very nice to have all these options are very nice and then down to ballistics here as you can see brand new options brand new toys to play with you can even create say a world war ii battleship in space by equipping it with these sort of like um mass driver turrets that have like quad barrels on it and create your sort of fantasy a space yamato if you would like you can even create a mac cannon ship so if you're familiar with the halo universe you can equip your ships with magnetic accelerator cannons and yes they're as devastating as one may expect and then down here a lot more hull to play with brand new hulls you even get drones to play with if you'd like and you get a brand new titan ship here to play with which is twice as big as the original titan that was released so a lot of options a lot of toys to play with now thanks to the combined arms mod so now at this point uh, what you want to do is you want to select what it is you want to research so to begin when you're starting off a new game i would start off with colonization buildings because when you go to colonize new worlds they're going to need some support in order to get themselves started so i'm going to click on this aeroponics bay right here sorry aeroponics farm i just right clicked on that just to bring up the screen here and what this aeroponics farm will do it will give us a plus two food per turn which is very good for starting uh, colonies obviously so i'm going to click on that and now as you can see on the right here it will show us our current research plus our turns now these turns are deferring to how long it will take or how many turns it will take in order to unlock this one building right here and these turns are tied to the rate of research that is going into what it is we're currently researching so that 110 right there is deferring to the aeroponics farm right there so what we want to do to increase this rate and decrease the amount of turns it will take is we want to go to our home world and fiddle around with some worker allocation there so let's get into that now all right so here we are at our home world the seedbed from which all great interstellar empires are created and what happens here will be critical to its success so let's get started right away so what you're seeing on the screen right here is a little bit of a spreadsheet i'll try to get through it as quickly and painlessly as possible so bear with me as we go through it let us begin with population so population of a planet denotes the economic capabilities that a planet is capable of doing from gathering food to production to research higher population planets can allocate their workforce to a greater degree than lower population planets and the population growth is based off a percentage of itself every five second turn that will grow slowly over time and then grow very quickly if there's large population on the planet the other factors that can increase the growth on a planet are freighters that will take colonists from high population worlds to low pop worlds assuming that the low pop world is capable of supporting the new colonists as well as certain colonization buildings that will increase the growth rate on a planet 
Now on to fertility here. So fertility is basically telling us how much food will be produced based off of the allocated amount of population we assign to food production per billion people. Also, based off our empire's preferred environments, we will receive a fertility bonus. So for example, the Dauntless here prefer Terran worlds over all others, and thus we'll gain the 1.5 bonus to the plant's fertility. In addition, if our fertility is above 1, we will receive a multiplier for buildings that give food production per assigned colonist. So that's fertility there. So now on to richness. Richness affects the amount in which we can create production. Higher richness means we can produce more production for less population allocation. However, over time, a planet's richness will decay based off of a chance per turn, and this chance of mineral richness decay goes up based off of the rate that we are creating uh, production from. So for example, we have our um, production here, and if we set our production to zero, that will lower the decay rate, okay, versus if we have our production set to, to the maximum, which will increase the rate of decay. In addition, if our planet is small, we'll also increase the rate of decay, so keep that in mind when colonizing new worlds there. So now on to governors. Governors are AI-controlled planetary overseers that automate food, production, research, export, and import. You can set your governor's behavior to specialize the planet into different directions. So for example, if you want your AI governor to focus on industry, for example, the AI will only build industry-based buildings while focusing on exporting and storing production and importing food. They can also automate the construction of garrisons and defensive platforms if you so choose that way. Okay, they can automate both of those. So that's the governor for you. I'm just going to set to manual for this next section here so I can play around with these bars for you. So now on to the assigned labor section, starting with food. So food goes into the survival of a population. That's simple. And a planet needs to have at least zero or 1.1 in order to self-sustain itself. If it has less than that, it will start pulling from storage here. So that's food. Now on to production here. Production is needed for the creation of starships, platforms, and buildings. Increasing the amount in which you receive production per turn is based off of the planet's richness, as we've stated, and the amount of population allocated towards production and production-based buildings. It is also tied to this new mechanic uh, called production infrastructure here, courtesy of the black box mod. Production infrastructure, simply put, is the amount of production you can pull from your storage along with the production the planet is making in your build queue here so mathematically speaking it is infrastructure uh, plus um the production or the production equals the total production infrastructure for the build queue here so let me let me expand on that a little bit so where's this uh plus 20 coming from so let me set it down to 10, just for math's sake, the production, okay. So now we have it set to 15, where's that plus 5 coming from? It's coming from the capital city. You can see those two hammers there. So you have 3 plus 1 uh, for the spaceport, those two hammers crossing. And there's a hidden production infrastructure tied to the plant as well, which is where you're getting your 5. So to get your uh, production infrastructure here, your total production infrastructure, I should say, it is production, okay, plus your um, infrastructure, your production infrastructure, which equals your maximum production to Q per turn, okay? That's what that's deferring to. Now, in order to activate this mechanic completely, what you can do is set your storage on your planet to import or export, by doing so, 
it will activate your full uh, production when putting it in, when constructing something to in, in the queue here so keep that in mind if you want to activate this mechanic otherwise it will just take five from storage if you set it to store in that way all right so that's production in a nutshell now on to research so here at research the uh, resource that goes into the development of unlocking new technologies in your research panel here in the top left the amount of research you gain per turn is based off of the allocation of available workers on a planet as well as research oriented buildings so our capital building would be considered a research oriented building as you can see those little science speakers there so with that uh, being said uh, we're just going to oh also you uh, research also comes from certain anomalies and artifacts coming uh, that appear on planets which also goes towards the technology you're in the process of researching just thought i'd mention that now at this point what we want to do before we do anything else let's maximize our research rate so we can unlock technologies as quickly as possible without crippling our home planet completely this does mean however we'll be affecting other areas such as food production and material production as you can see and obviously our taxes are um gonna be affected uh at the, i should probably show off what happens just for for your sake so when i have the taxes set to 100 percent you can see that our production went to zero and our research went to zero so if you want to maximize your research or your production it may be a good idea to just like lower your taxes in order to get the most out of your production or the most out of your research and then allocate your workers towards something because we do have food in our storage i'm not too worried about the the rate of food loss because it will only take eight food over every five second period which is okay for me and my purposes now at this point i'm just going to unpause the game and we're going to be talking about building ships and troops in our build menu here here in our build menu is where we'll find our buildings we don't have any right now but if we did this is where we would find our buildings platforms and ships we'll find ships right here and in in order to activate your ships here you need to have a spaceport on your planet or a capital city okay before you can have access to the construction of ships okay keep that in mind when uh, colonizing um, colonizing certain planets now <clears throat> Certain items constructed in the build menu cost both planetary uh, production and empire treasury to produce. This is on top of the upkeep necessary to maintain certain colony buildings, ships, and platforms. Here is where we'll create our first scout, scout craft. So in order to build a scout craft ship, sorry, <laughs> I'm fumbling over my words now. Uh, simply go to your ships go to your scout section build menu find the scout and then click on the scout ship i'm just going to pause right here just for um just for for a second here and then it will appear in the build queue down below now every home world is also capable of making troops and making some troops from our home world wouldn't be a bad idea so let's do that too i'm gonna make two Troops uh, have a very high utility. They can uh, defend planets from invasions, invade planets, investigate anomalies, and even board enemy ships, taking them over. Uniquely, however, troops do not require any upkeep whatsoever while on a planet, only requiring a flat production rate to build. So I've built two troops to start, and if we like, we can even automate the production of troops as garrisons there. Now we've got a couple of items down here in what is called the construction queue. Now once you've selected a building, a ship, or troop that you want constructed, it will appear here. The speed in which a building, ship, or troop is constructed is based off your production, production infrastructure, and if you set your production to uh, set import or export. Okay, 
I set it to import there just to maximize our, our rate here if we would like. There are some other things you can do once you have a ship being built or troop being built or a building being built. You can rush production on a ship with this little hammer and sickle thing or just the two hammers here upon which all available production regardless if a planet's production is set to storage will be sent to the item in the construction queue however there will also be a credit cost attached that is equal to the production sent to the build queue on top of the ship's total credit investment if you're building a ship that needs a credit investing so for example let's just go back to ships here and let's talk about maybe this um this colony ship so let's say this colony ship just rounded up to say 90 production okay if i rush this colony ship that costs 90 production sending all 90 available production to the build queue the construction queue it will cost you also 90 credits plus the 18 credits on top of that that the ship needs as an investment so keep that in mind when rushing uh, ships it will probably uh, destroy your economy a little bit speaking of credits we've talked about it a little bit for ships you'll also notice there's a credit cost attached to ships this is the total amount of credits that the ship will need invested over the course of its construction and the amount of credits is based off of the total production cost of a ship as a percentage which is also based off of the difficulty we're playing playing on so right now i'm playing on normal difficulty okay the credit cost of a ship will be 20 percent of a ship's total production cost also if the ship is cancelled at any point so we're putting some investment in here okay so some money in here right if we cancel that at any point all the credits invested into the ship will be lost but we'll gain some production back back for that so keep that in mind so that is all the important mechanics that you'll experience while looking at a planet now let's get on with the galaxy itself and do some scouting so i'll be with you in a second here all right so here we are overlooking our home planet and as you can see we have our new scout ship available to us so at this point we just want to get into the scouting proper so we're going to click on our scout ship and we'll be given information in the bottom left here but we're interested in this little arrow we want to expand on that and we'll be given four options resupply refit scrap and scout we'll click on that and once we do so our scout ship will begin scouting the whole entire galaxy and will not stop until every planet has been discovered or it gets destroyed you can also tell your ships to scout from the ships array in the top left here if you like and from here you'll be given information on all your ships available to you within your empire it will tell you the system from which your ships are located in the ships itself the role of the ship and the current orders of the ship as well as some basic commands you can give your ships from scouting refitting and scrapping and the ship's strength its credit cost how many troops ftl how many troops it has on the ship as it should say ftl and stl speeds okay so that's ships array in a nutshell but now at this point i'm gonna take our scout this extra scout and tell him to explore this solar system manually because i think there might be something interesting there i'm also gonna speed up the footage here okay i'm gonna tell him to scout this planet here and any second now he'll have it scouted and okay we've scouted the planet perfect so at this point we can do one of three things we can send troops to investigate this anomaly we can also colonize the planet and we can also review the planet from our planet recon screen so why don't we do all three from the planet recon screen because we can send troops and colonize it from this one screen so why don't we do that so here on the planet recon screen it's called the planet's array and likes the like the ship's array it will tell you information about your planet where they're located in the system the planet's name and the proximity of the planet in relation to your home world 
So the plant we just discovered is Itan Itanami, Itanami, I think it is, and it is near to Sechi 3. That's basically what it's referring to there. We can also see the anomaly on the planet, the fertility of the planet, richness, the max population, that sort of thing, as well as the current owner there. So now at this point, we want to send some troops. We have five available troops to us. So I'm going to send all five of them as well as our available colony ship. Okay. If we don't have a colony ship, we can still click on it and our empire will produce a new one for us. Okay. It's all automated for us. So we don't have to micromanage too much. Okay. So now our colony ship and our troops are going to be sent over here. Okay. I'm just gonna zoom right on in there, okay? And I'm gonna slow it down just a bit. It should take any second now for our troops to land. Oh, and I'm gonna tell them to stop. And the reason why I'm gonna tell my colony ship to not colonize it right away because I want to investigate this anomaly first to make sure the plant is safe for colonization. So we're gonna let our troops do their work first, okay? So they landed right on top of this sort of abandoned mine here. I'm hoping that it's safe. All right, awesome. So it is safe, okay? So sometimes, let's talk about anomalies since we're here. Without uh, spoiling too much, anomalies are investigatable planetary curiosities that can vary between finding new ancient ship weapons that can be researched then equipped to your ships to negatives such as finding a horde of skeletons running down your troops and outposts luckily this anomaly has yielded us some money which will be very useful and we can now use our colony ship to colonize the planet since it's now safe it's pretty nice sometimes uh, we'll come across skeletons and that's not very nice now either isn't it so I'm going to tell our colony ship to colonize now. Okay, I just left click on him, right click on the colony sh on the colony that we want colonized or the plant we want colonized there. And now we want to head to the next section here, your first planet. So let's get into that now. All right, so we've colonized the planet and as you can see, the planet's colony grid here has these gray little boxes. And these gray little boxes denote an uninhabitable area and every planet type varies with the amount of uninhabitable area it begins at. With barren planets being some of the most uninhabitable but also the most numerous planets out there. All this in turn will affect the planet's overall economic production because we don't have a lot of space for colony buildings. We can solve this however in two ways terraformers or biospheres biospheres being a permanent colony building that once unlocked from the research screen and placed will have an upkeep cost to it so be aware of that terraformers are much more expensive but will actually slowly change the quality of the planet over a long period of time to a turn world which is overall the best kind of planet in the game and can also convert uninhabitable grid tiles in the meantime but both biospheres and terraformers are quite expensive to unlock in the research screen so it's a little impractical to consider at the start of the game other than that we can work on this planet in similar ways that we could with our home planet we can establish governors to do most of our dirty work and we can do it ourselves as well if we so choose for this i'm going to set the planetary governor to core but also build an aeroponics farm to start. Okay, because it's a nice starter building that gives us plus two food per turn. Very nice for starter colonies. But as you can see, the amount of mineral production going into the creation of aeroponics is super low. Unfortunately, this is because our planet has barely any population to speak of, only at 0.05. And it's going to be very difficult for us to construct our aeroponics unless we can get material from elsewhere. Luckily, we have freighters for that. So let's talk about how to transport goods now. 
So, in order to start transporting goods between our two planets, we're going to need freighters. Let's go back to our home planet here, as it is the planet that is most capable of producing the freighters that we need. So, we're going to click on that, click on ships, click on freighters, produce two freighters, and now I'm going to rush production just to go through the process that much more quicker. And voila, we got two freighters with us today. However, there is going to be one problem. While they're going to be transporting colonists automatically, because our new world is capable of sustaining new colonists, they will not be transporting anything else. That is because we haven't set our planets to import and export goods. Let's do that now. Let's go to our home planet here and begin exporting by simply setting our storage to export. Okay, that's step one done. Now step two is go to the planet that you want to import uh, goods to, to import. And that's pretty much done. We've established our trade lanes there. You can also automate this process by setting up the appropriate governors and they'll automatically set up the import, export, and storage uh, settings for you without any micromanagement on your part there. Now. What will happen at this point here here on henceforth is now whenever you produce a freighter thanks to the black box mod the freighters will automatically without any input from you will automatically begin transporting goods between the planets that will will need goods you can also set up certain behaviors if you don't like that if you want a certain manual control of your freighters there you can set up some aos so for example this one freighter I just clicked on is going to be transporting to any planet that will need sort of uh, any sort of delivery. However, if we click on this square right here, this AO, we can establish a AOs. So now that I've established that square, now that freighter will only operate within this square. So that's the one way. The other way is we can have this one freighter transport goods between very specific planets by clicking on these like three moons here. So we're going to click on that and we're going to click on our SETI 3 and that will give us our trade route for our SETI 3 and then we're going to establish our trade route for our new world here. Okay, so now at this point this one freighter will begin transporting goods between only SETI 3 and Etamine 5. Okay, so we're just going to watch it all happen in front of us right now. Just going to speed up the game time here. And we can see it happen for us right here. So now they're going back and forth, back and forth. We can even check out our new planet, see how it's doing here. I'm going to tell you to build stuff because you got some goodies and I want you to start building. So there, now it's going to be using up some storage for um, our production. And now it's set up the import because uh, we set up our governor that way. So now the whole entire empire at this point is pretty much automated. However, what is a transport lane, a trade lane, without a multispatial super highway to speed up the transportation process? We can do this with subspace projectors, so why don't we talk about that now? Alright, so here we are talking about subspace projectors now. So subspace projectors are basically space roads. They're quite useful as they increase FTL speed by 50%, which can further be upgraded with the right technology unlock. And not only that, thanks to the black box mod, now whenever enemy forces breach your sub projector field, the projectors themselves will warn you of any enemies. What great utility, so why don't we build some? So in order to make some subspace projectors, we have to make sure we got the subspace projector technology unlocked. I've gone ahead to do so, as you can see. Okay, and now we're capable of making subspace projectors. You'll find them in the bottom right here. These two hammers crisscrossed with each other. This will be your deep space building window. You want to click on that and that'll open up the build menu. So you'll see subspace projectors right there. You'll also notice it has a cost involved, so be aware of that. You don't want to build too many of these unless you're ready to support, support those subspace projector fields. Now, when I scroll out here, you'll notice this orange circle. This orange circle will denote your subspace projector field, and everything within this circle will receive FTL buffs, and any enemy found within that orange circle will be basically um, tripping the um, 
border security as it were just letting you know that there are enemies in the area so now to place them very simple you just want to place it like so just click on that that silhouette will appear and now at this point you'll notice that a constructor will be constructing at any appropriate building or sorry not building but um planet now let's say you have a constructor on its way but you don't like the construction of or the placement of a projector you can just click on it and delete it and the constructor will also go back and uh, scrap itself so you get your get money back there but let's also say will he return back no he won't okay so a new constructor will be placed or will be built and will go to this subspace projector right here okay any second now i'll just build this or quicken the game speed here and voila subspace projector is built and again if you don't like the placement you can always just right click go other oh geez oh, i'm not ready for you i'm not ready for you you will talk about you guys in a moment okay not ready anyways and if you want to delete your subspace projector fields you can always right click click scuttle oh geez okay and you can also go to the ships array and go to all structures or where are they it's not there platforms not in fleet fighters frigates civilian no structures ah huh. ah huh. interesting okay so it's not in ships array so if you want to delete your subspace projectors you have to scuttle them manually i thought it would be in ships array but anywho anywho that's basically subspace projectors in a nutshell so we're going to place maybe a few of those all the way to our planet here okay that will extend our subspace superhighway all the way to etanomy because etanomy needs support as you can see there's stuff over there <laughs> However, because we have gotten contact with a couple of potentially hostile forces, uh, it might be a good idea to place some platforms as well. Okay, so you can place platforms, defense platforms, or even subspace projectors around specific planets, and they will orbit around the planet and track it. It's a good way of creating static defenses for core worlds there. So we have talked about quite a lot about subspace projectors but that's a lot of clicking isn't it click on this click on that click on these it's all quite tedious but there is a way to alleviate the burdens of your fingers and that is with automation there so why don't we talk about that in the bottom right talk about some automation all right so here we are talking about automation of your empire so down all the way down in the bottom left of your screen you'll see this ai menu here is where we can automate a great chunk of our empire in this screen right here. In fact, almost everything that we've gone through so far can be automated from this automation screen. So why don't we go through all that right now, starting with Auto Explorer. So when we activate Auto Explorer, what will happen is the appropriate planets capable of building ships will start adding scouts as part of their build queue. When those ships are finished construction, those ships will automatically be in scouting without your say-so. Auto Explorer will continue to be activated until all the planets in the galaxy are explored. Sounds useful for the automation process. I'm going to click on that. I'm also going to pause the game here. Now let's talk about Auto Colonize. So Auto Colonize will, upon activation, will begin building colony ships and will begin colonizing desirable planets. In what it considers like a desirable planet is basically anything that doesn't have a bad population, a bad fertility, and a bad richness. A, a good richness and a good fertility is considered at least one richness and one fertility, and maybe like a couple billion uh, population uh, cap per world. That's what it kind of con considers a good planet, uh, as far as auto colonize is concerned. That's basically it in a, in a nutshell. It will auto automatically colonize plants that you've discovered there. Okay, auto colonize. Now let's talk about auto build projectors. Auto build projectors will automatically create constructor ships, which then will go on to create subspace projectors, connecting every world to every other world until all your planets are connected within the subspace network. 
Be forewarned, however, the sudden mass of subspace projectors may overwhelm your economy. If not prepared, so be ready for that. So now we have automatic trade here. Quite simply, automatic trade, when activated, will automatically produce freighters until your empire's freighter needs are met for importing and exporting goods. Very simple there. And now auto pick colony ship. Basically, it will pick the best ship for colonization. That's basically it. How it considers the best colony ship is based off of its FTL speed, I would think. I would think that's basically it so auto pick freighter now quite simply when automatic trade okay is activated along with auto pick freighter the game will select the best freighter within your empire how the game decides what is the best freighter is based off of the freighter's transport size and ftl speed basically and then we have auto research here auto research will automatically research technologies in a preset build order without your input so you may want that you may not want that i find the um, the, the preset build order for research isn't too bad but depending on the situation you may want certain technologies unlocked uh, before others so i'll leave this up to you and now we have auto taxes here so auto taxes, we talked about this before in the economy overview screen. It's basically that same system here. So it's it's here, but it's also found here. It's the same thing there. It'll automatically tax your empire. So now to continuous rush. Continuous rush when selected will rush production on all the items within the construction queue on a planet. Because rushing production does take treasury resources, this does mean continuous rushing will hurt your economy if you're not prepared. And then we have disable building alerts. This is new. Normally, when you manually add a building to the economy's, sorry, the colony's building queue, you will be notified when it is completed. You can disable these notifications if you tend to manually build most of your buildings. So it basically removes alerts <laughs> that's all it really is saying there if you don't want to have your alert screen be filled with alerts you can disable these alerts and that will alleviate a good chunk of it there so that's again that's the automation process in a nutshell but you've probably noticed these sort of selectors here and what these selectors do is they allow us to designate a ship that we would want to use for the automation process However, we haven't really designed any new ships to replace these old insufficient ships in our selectors. If we use these ships as part of, as part of our uh, automation process, we may get a weaker empire than necessary. So why don't we rectify that with the shipyard here. Very exciting. So here we are in probably the biggest part of the game, the shipyard. And at the shipyard, we can design a completely new ship using the technologies we have and the technologies we'll unlock in the future. Right now though, we're going to be looking at our old designs and pointing out flaws in them, then designing new freighters and scout craft from scratch. So let's get started there. First, we're going to load up our old freighter here. So load up a freighter, you just click on the sort of ship sort of file that you want and as you can see this is a freighter that we have currently floating around in space click on that we have it selected and click load okay so that's the freighter we can now play around with and as you can see on the right side here we have our statistics that are tied to the ship we have the production cost the upkeep cost power capacity um total hit points ftl speed all the goodies we even have the cargo space uh, per unit all the important things that you want to know but I feel we can improve on this design. I think this design has a few flaws in it. Like I don't like the placement of the nuclear reactors, for example. I feel like we can do, do some good things here. Okay, so at this point, we can strip the ship. And this is a new feature in the black box mod. Okay, stripping the ship will remove everything except the engines and the command modules. Okay everything that you'd consider useful so we'll click on that and as you can see all the sort of ancillary modules have been removed there but let's say i want to remove more stuff here okay and how do i make that as efficient as possible what we can do 
is maybe we could go to this new mirror mode this symmetric design mode here this is also a new feature included in the black box mod wasn't included in the vanilla experience now whatever you do on say the left side of a ship or the right side of the ship when you're in uh, symmetry mode will be copied on the right side so if i want to right click this module to remove it it will now be copied on the right side there same thing okay i can also go back to normal mode and if i put say those engines back okay now i can only remove one at a time so that's a nice feature to to use if you want to um uh get just get rid of uh, certain modules there but there's also another way let's reload the old the old uh, freighter again if you just want to create a brand new absolutely new fresh freighter you can just click on the hull here click on that now you get a new freighter and this is what we're going to be using to design our new freighter from okay so now at this point you can see that our blank freighter is made up of individual slots these slots make up the whole entirety of the ship we can see the i slots the o slots and the e slots which correspond to certain modules that can only go in these specific sp uh, spaces like engines for example can only go into the e slots another way to describe ship design in star drive is like a number paint system that you used to do as a kid in the sense that each ship starts off as say a blank canvas that you paint it with the appropriate modules that go into the right slot that you have access to from your little paint palette here okay this is where you'd get your modules from and where you'd want to place them okay so there's that but like any good paint job any good painting a painting is only considered complete when the whole entire canvas underneath that painting is covered up with paint and star drives uh, ship hulls are no different in order for a ship to be considered complete each slot must be filled okay and at least a cockpit power and engines in order to make it functional beyond that your only limit is your production technology and imagination but right now our only limit is the fact we're just making a freighter so let's get into that now so as stated earlier each ship hull needs a cockpit engine and power to get running so let's get started with power power comes from reactors which produce power at a flat rate per second and when i place power on our ship here you can see a power radius being produced and this power radius will power modules that need it for example engines will need to um, have power delivered to them in order to function so when i place an engine right here for example it is now powered when you place another one it is not powered because it's outside of the radius here okay we can extend this radius however with a power conduit that when placed right beside a power reactor will extend that radius even further as you can also see on the right here if i place another um, ship or sorry another engine we can see our overall power being produced being reduced due to our power expenditure coming from both the conduits and the engines here if we get to the point of negative power for ftl travel due to having too much power expenditure that will affect how long we can stay at faster than light travel for okay faster than light time is in seconds so right now we can only stay in ftl for five seconds before we need to come out of warp and then recharge our power capacity here and then we can stay at warp for another five seconds so on and so forth we can solve this issue in one of two ways we can either add another reactor okay which will give us a, a greater recharge at warp which will put us in the green and then we can have infinite ftl time or we can add some let's just remove that we can add some power cells here which will in also increase our ftl time in addition uh, fuel cells power cells are also considered ammunition for energy based weapons there okay just want to uh, mention that 
So I think that's okay just for like an example. Now we need to add some more engines. Right now we have sort of three official engines to choose from. We have the small engine, which is the Jack of all trades engine. Okay, it has a little bit of thrust, a little bit of warp, a little bit of turn radius. Okay, we also have warp engines here, which is more focused on getting the ship to warp. It has very tiny thrust, extreme warp, tiny turn. Okay. And then we have the small combat thruster, which is more focused on sublight speeds. But because we are using a freighter here, I want to be focused uh, all about warp. So I'm going to be replacing, actually, all these with warp capable modules. So now, as you can see, our recharge at warp is at 32. That's because of our power at warp here is minus 20. Whereas the overall power for our small warp engines are just minus 10 so the general power here is just tied to the overall ship whereas the recharge at warp here is tied to when the ship is at warp so we have a power recharge at nine which is good that means when this ship just comes out of dock straight out out of dock it won't just run out of power whereas if it goes to warp it will start running out of power and it will stay at warp for or ftl i should say for at least uh, 16 seconds there so now at this point, what we can do, because technically this is a, a, a good enough design for just for an example here, we can just start placing some cockpits. Cockpits need to be placed also within a power, uh, power radius in order to be powered up and they must be powered up in order to uh, be functional on the ship. Otherwise it won't be, you know, it won't, uh, it won't fly the ship because it's not powered. And now at this point, we also need some cargo. And as you can see, if you notice on our FTL, our FTL speed is getting lower and lower. That's because of the mass. As we add mass to our ship, the overall maneuverability of the ship will go down because it is getting heavier and heavier. And now technically that is a complete design that will function for our F or I was going to say FTL or for our freighter needs. But as you can also see, we have this big red design issues here. This is introduced by the black box mod. This is brand new. What this sort of feature will do is it will, it will just sort of give you a guideline on how to sort of optimize your ship uh, a little bit better. You know, so for example, it has very low warp time and the, the ship's ability to sustain warp speed is limited and its remation, it's basically its suggestions are to add reactors to increase the power output of the ship or energy storage to increase warp time. So basically what we've just talked about earlier. But you know what, This we, we can make a better ship here. I think I'm gonna do so. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of this and I'm going to go to auxiliary power core. This auxiliary power core is introduced by the combined arms mod. If we place it like that, that will give us both, both warp speed and power and power radius. So now our whole entire ship is powered and we got extra FTL speed there. So I feel like that's pretty good for design, you know, just as an example. So let's start talking about behaviors here. So we got a couple of behaviors here. We got our attack, uh, our head on attack runs. This is mostly for fighters. They will fly around the ship doing attack runs here and there, that sort of thing. And then we have forward facing. So what it's saying right here is basically the ship will rotate so that the forward firing weapons are facing its target. If in a fleet, it will attempt to maintain formation. If not, the ship will maneuver to within maximum weapons range and if a carrier the ship will use the carrier hangar range so if you have multiple weapons on a ship it will use the wep the, the the highest range weapons on that ship as its engagement range there that's what it's basically saying for the most part and then for this one it's basically this this one but in reverse it will use the lowest range weapons as its engagement range so it will actually get even closer to the ship there and then we have hold position here this is basically where the ship will engage targets but will not move from its spot it's kind of like a turret mode for the ship that's basically it and then we have a sort of a circling where the ship will broadside either port or starward while circling the ship 
and then we have our sort of hold position but for broadsides here so you can broadside hold position port or broadside hold position starboard and then you have this sort of non-combat behavior where the ship will avoid engaging combat which is good for freighters and all that and then finally we have to set our repair options here so depending on how you set your repair options will decide when the ship will go back to base in order to auto automatically repair itself so right now i have it set to civilian oh let me let go okay so i have it set to civilian here so what that means is as the ship takes damage once the ship's overall integrity is down to 95 percent it will see that detect that and then automatically just fly back to a planet in order to repair so that's good for uh, non-combat ships there now at this point we're pretty much good to go i mean that's that's good enough i would think let's do a review let's compare it with say other freighters um so this has almost what uh, double the warp speed uh, not almost double but a little bit more warp speed a little less sublight speed and its turn radius is not very good we can fix that with say this turn thruster right here this turn thruster only is good for the io slots so this would be an i slot an i slot okay so we can place those there because it's green and we're allowed to okay and so as you can see we got our turn rate up our ftl has gone uh up as well because these churn thrusters have a little bit mess less mass than say a cargo hold which means we have improved but we have gone down for our cargo space but i think that's overall okay for a freighter of of this type so at this point what we want to do is save our design so what we're going to do is just give it uh, a sort of a designation so d for dauntless and we're going to call it the freighter here say that's pretty good like okay and that's good so now you're probably wondering what about a colony ship how do i make that it's actually very simple you just want to place this colony module here okay and that's pretty much it however a colony module does not need small cargo holds so you don't need that but if you remember earlier you have to fill all these slots so what do you fill these slots in if not cargo holds well thankfully thanks to the combined arms mod we have these special little filler structures they're very cheap very low on mass and they're designed just to fill these sort of spots here okay so now this ship is capable of colonizing other planets which is very good so we're going to save that and call it the d colony very nice so that's good overwrite very nice and now what about a uh, constructor ship what about making a better constructor so we have this constructor array here okay this is i think either you unique to black box oh is it, is it long oh it can't be placed on the oh only an eye i see okay okay that's that's fine it can i ooh, yeah make it a little tighter ooh, like that ooh fine you get four small nuclear reactors then so that's a complete design as well i'm actually gonna make it a little bit better actually that turn radius is actually not bad that's pretty good that's pretty good i like that so now you have a constructor array these constructor arrays i'm pretty sure are coming from the black box or maybe the ci i forget which mod it comes from um apologies about that but these constructor arrays just allow you to make custom constructors so if you don't like the constructors that it comes with that comes with the game you can make improved designs like i kind of have and i'm pretty sure they are improved let's go to constructor and just look at the sort of like the information there and cross reference it with the information down here and yeah i think overall i've made a better better ship overall I think it's pretty good okay so i like that design we can just save call it deconstructor okay that's pretty good save that so yeah that's pretty nice so we've made our freighter we made our colony ship and we made our new constructor so now let's get into how to make our official scout craft let's get into that now
All right, so for this section, what we're gonna be doing here is gonna be creating a proper scout and we're gonna be using our fighter hull to do so. Just gonna click on that. And now, because we know the basics of ship design, this part will go a whole lot quicker. So let's get started. So instead of using a nuclear reactor for this, I'll be using our auxiliary power core because as previously mentioned earlier, auxiliary power core does give us a warp of 75k, which is very nice. And it comes with its own power and its own power radius, which is also very nice indeed. Now we're going to put in two warp engines just to increase that FTL speed that much further. Then we're going to follow it up with a cockpit. Now, technically, once we just fill this in, we will be done, but we can make it even better by adding a small sensor. Now, these small sensors are included in the combined arms mod, okay? And that will extend our vision radius, okay, our optical radius to 60K before it was only at 20. So that uh, extra 40K is gonna uh, be quite beneficial. Now, we can just fill in the rest of the space. Where are we here? With these structures the fill structures and the reason why I'm using these fill structures over anything else is because it will keep our scout craft light and nimble and we'll need that in order to uh, maximize our FTL speed there so now our FTL is at 104k 114k I'm sorry uh, sublight speed is uh, 166 and then turn rate is uh, 13 degrees per second so overall that's pretty good our recharge at warp is in the positive so that means we'll stay at warp 100% of the time with no downtime which is excellent for a scout craft so all in all this is a pretty good scout vehicle I would think we could even probably make this a little bit hardier by putting a small sensor in the back that way if there is any sort of firepower coming towards it in the front at least it has a little bit of defense uh, protecting it's a uh, slightly actually this is a lot more stronger it has 80 health now nah, it'll stay in the back so this is this is nice and clean I like this now it's nice and pretty now the next thing we need to do is to set our repair options to recon and then set it to non-combat that way it will stay out of combat as much as possible in addition we want to set it to recon uh, because when we use this for automation purposes it will appear as part of part of the auto scout list if you set it to say conservative and you want to use this ship for auto, auto scouting for example it will not appear on the list because of the repair options is set to conservative so you want to set that to recon to uh, have uh, your scout ships to appear as um well as an option to use in the automation uh, auto scout option there okay so anyways that is a done ship there a nice done craft so i'm gonna call it the d scout very good very nice i like that done so now why don't we talk about making our first combat fighter since we're here let's get into that now getting real excited now all right, so here we are back at the shipyard, but this time we're going to be designing a fresh fighter hull and we'll follow the basic tenets of ship design here like usual. We're going to begin with reactors and I'm going to put reactors right in the middle here as to extend the radius as much as possible, covering all the, the points that we need, the engines and a little bit of the forward uh, hull right there. And now at this point, we're going to be putting engines. Okay, I'm going to put a sort of small jack of all trades engine and a combat thruster. The reason why I'm using a small engine here and a combat thruster is because I want my fighter to focus on sublight uh, combat. So I want it to be very maneuverable. Uh, the small engine here is a little bit of a mixture between the warp engine and the combat engine. And I'm using not the warp engine because I want to use a more more like sub uh, sub light speed and turn rate while being able to stay at a, at a relatively decent uh, FTL speed as well so that's why I'm using that sort of mixture there now we want to place the cockpit like so and now for the final thing is weapons this is the fun part now but because we haven't really researched uh, too many weapons I'm gonna be using the Vulcan cannon available to us as an example Okay, go to weapon. We do have energy weapons. I'm going to show off the Vulcan cannon here. And we're going to click on the weapon like so. We can see the stats in the bottom left like any other module. 
and we can place it on our ship like so. So this weapon here, you can see this radius. This is brand new to um, the black box mod where you can see a, a very nice, a very clean looking uh, sort of a attack radius grid here. So what this means is this weapon, when, when the ship sort of attacks another ship, this weapon will only fire upon when uh, an enemy ship is when is within its sort of radius here but because the radius is going all the way through the middle of the ship when this uh, ship does attack another ship this weapon will fire upon another another ship because it's, it's within its radius that's basically what it is okay however there is a brand new mechanic introduced by the black box mod which is weapon accuracy now when your weapons fire there is something akin to that of a cone of fire in the sense that when the weapon itself may be firing at a very specific module the accuracy of the weapon will allow the weapon to miss the aim point so let me show that off a little bit here so i got the vulcan selected okay got that selected or um Sorry, nope. I got like it, it got it selected like I'm over it so I um, can see it. So I'm going to scroll back out here. There it is. So you can see these little white circles here. So these little white circles would denote the sort of cone of fire. All right. Now this cone of fire can be increased as in to say uh, tighter, made more tighter with uh sort of control modules which would be cockpits bridges and i think uh command control centers that sort of thing so if i scroll back just a little bit more oh no scroll back out okay and i right click as to remove this cockpit here you'll see that white circle got bigger okay because the cockpit actually does increase accuracy of the ship so you have this fcs accuracy right there which increases the accuracy of weapons by one and if we look at the vulcan cannon right here and we look at accuracy okay uh, i'll just read this out to you weapon target error radius measured in ship slots an accuracy of minus six means the weapon will hit within a six slot radius of the target point as i've said like the aim point tar target point above or below range uh 2300 the error will gradually increase or decrease uh, based off of the fire control systems turreted weapons traits and crew level okay so so you see the accuracy of 4.16 this is a reference to the, the white circle here if i put the cockpit back on it got a lot, lot tighter here so now this red circle okay this is the range okay this is not denoting the weapons max range the, the weapons max range is actually to this white circle right here but it's telling you basically um it, it's kind of a reference to other hulls so this little red circle right here would be the rough size of an enemy fighter okay so now we can see this white circle is smaller than the the rough size of a fighter so that's pretty good okay and as this sort of fighter obviously would if we were to visualize this fighter being at say the max weapon distance then that circle would encapsulate uh the fighter a little bit less than if it were closer so it's very it, it's kind of like like the cone of fire in an fps game so when a person is like closer to you obviously the cone of fire would be a, a lot better because you're going to get more shots off on target but if the target is further the way uh, further away from you then that cone of fire is going to get bigger 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 until like most of your shots are going to be missing i'm hoping that makes sense to everybody to make it even more simpler basically you you want good cockpits in order to increase the accuracy of your guns all right that's basically it for accuracy so now i'm gonna put on another vulcan cannon right here and now at this point we just need to put an ordinance because these guns cannot fire without proper ordinance ordinance they do come with their own ordinance boxes but they don't last very long you can see the ammo time right here which means if these bo both of these weapons were to be firing at the same time constantly then they would be only lasting for 13 seconds which maybe for fighters that's okay for you for me it's not so i want to put in some ordinance here so we can put in just one ordinance box and now that jumped that all the way up to 55 seconds with an ordinance capacity of 33 i wouldn't really pay attention to ordinance capacity it's not that relevant ammo time is a lot more important so you want to pay attention to that i would recommend at the very least having an ammo time of maybe 60 seconds um 
is good because you don't know what's going to go on on the battlefield and maybe your fighters are going to last very long but if they run out of ammo then they it's like well <laughs> then they have to all go back to base to uh, rearm and all that stuff so we're going to fill this out now because I, th I feel like it's okay uh, actually you know what we can put in some static barriers static barriers are introduced by the combined arms mod uh, these are mostly mostly used for fighters just at the very start of the game just to give them that much more um survival ability and it's not really a bad idea to put on one static barrier just for a brand new fighter that you're designing and this is pretty good now I, I i'm actually liking this design i think it's decent you know for what it is so now we just want to fill in the rest now i'm going to use these basic structure blocks because that will keep my sublight speed pretty high and my turn radius high because structure again if we remember earlier have a very low mass and very low cost and i want my fetter to be as zippy as possible here that's why i'm using these fill and these fill at the front is good because when the ship takes fire upon things and, and once the shields go down these weapons won't be removed right away because these structures will add a, just a little bit more survival ability because they will be absorbing the blunt of the damage before the weapons or the cockpit or even the shield, shields will so this creates a nice little wall of um, module right there even though it's very weak even though it's very weak so I think that's a decent design. So now at this point, we want to set our repair options. I recommend conservative for all your ships because when you set it at conservative, uh, it, the ship will go back to repair at 80%, which is pretty, pretty good uh, for most ships. I think most ships that are around 80% um, HP are probably on their way out already. So you want to bring them back to base to repair as much as possible. All right. So now... You want to set your behavior here for fighters i do recommend head on attack because we want to put um good emphasis on the mobility of the fighter here because mobility is tied to its survival ability if it just uh just stays sitting still with its forward facing weapons that allows other enemy weapons to be have a beat on it that much quicker and obviously because it doesn't survive have a very much sort of survival ability on its own it's just going to be taken out very easily so for fighters i recommend a head-on attacks okay with a very good sublight speed and a very good turn radius so this is decent enough for what it is Oh, let's go to design uh slow warp speed that's fine a uh, low ac uh, weapon accuracy there's nothing we can really do about that we don't have higher fcs control modules in order to fix the average weapon accuracy but for for this you know this is good you know that's a pretty tight uh cone of fire i, I guess if you want to call it a cone of fire um for a fighter you know this is pretty decent that's that's pretty decent i'm, I'm satisfied so We've set everything up. We're okay with this. I'm okay with the FTL speed. All right, uh, 83.83k is a little bit ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know about you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't need my uh, FTL speed, especially for a smaller map. You don't need your FTL speed to be at. Um, let me just exit here again. You don't need your FTL speed to be at 83 like 83k especially for small maps like 23 or 25k ftl speed is actually kind of decent so don't worry about that for if it's suggesting that to you so i'm just going to save that here okay and we're going to call it the d fighter okay that's pretty nice d fighter sure all right so that's our fighter that's pretty nice that's pretty basic it's got a nice balance between uh defense and offense you know and it's got a small ordinance box just so it can stay in the fight for that much longer could i even reduce this Ooh, i even could make it even slightly oh no not quite i need to have a, a second a second um generator or reactor right there i need to save it again so there you go so that's a fighter pretty much all done for us now you're probably wondering well what about other ships what about other hulls i want to see something bigger stronger faster well why don't we talk about the dauntless battleship let's design a dauntless battleship here all right, so here we are about to design our battleship. So I've gone on ahead quite a bit and I've locked all the hulls and all the weapons. That way I can really show off what the game is capable of as far as ship design is concerned. So 
we're going to begin i'm going to click on toggle overlay here so we can see how many modules we have we can actually see see that right here the total module slots is at 394 quite a lot quite a bit but you know we can get through it together like a family so um the lore of the Dauntless is that they're very much a missile-focused faction. So I'm going to stay within that theme and make a uh, missile-focused ship. So as I've said earlier, I have unlocked all the weapons. I'm going to scroll all the way down here, and I'm going to use a tactical nuke as our primary weapon here. And I'm going to set it right in the middle. That way it's nice and nestled and protected within the sort of overall ship shape, you know. I think it's appropriate as you can see in the stats here we got quite a bit of damage quite a bit of range its blast radius is quite high so how blast radius works let me just show that off quite uh to, to give you a visual so let's say the blast radius for a weapon is uh three so it's got blast radius of three so if when the missile or the projectile hits a target let's say it hits right here okay and that explodes the blast radius of three that means it'll extend out three you know well not three because this it also includes this module as well as part of its explosion radius but i just want to show that off as it's like epicenter aim point so it goes out three and that will be its total blast radius right there that's all the modules it will affect so as you can see if i toggle overlay that's quite a sizable chunk of the ship so you can imagine having a blast radius of 10 <laughs> would be even larger right so that's pretty much like the whole half of the ship just like boom taken out so that makes it a very powerful missile to equip your your ships with okay very nice very nice indeed so there's the primary uh now we want the secondaries i'm gonna go for mrm mark ones mrm mark ones do exist on a turret and now for weapons that are on turrets you can actually rotate this firing radius there are weapons that are fixed so for example this tactical nuke you cannot rotate it unless for example uh, da, 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 da. if you use your arrow keys you can rotate it like so if you so choose we're not recommend because that's kind of silly looking but if you so choose you can rotate it any degree that you want only 90 however 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 if it's on a turret you can rotate it however you choose if you hold shift you can make that fine-tuned okay but if you let go it will be able to rotate at a degree of 15 degrees per Per, per turn as it were unless you hold shift like i said holding shift will allow you to fine tune your um your firing angles there so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna add multiple mrm mark ones because they're pretty decent i, I think they have a blast radius of 2.5 range of five uh, 5800 damage of uh, 390 but they shoot two at once salvo of two so that's pretty nice and they have this t range and t speed so this is brand new to the combined arms mod he has edited a lot of the missiles just to give him a little bit more uh, character you know a little bit more personality so what happens for the mrms is you can probably read it right there when this missile reaches a certain terminal point okay this is the t range terminal range then it will start accelerating to a speed of 4200 which is very fast. So the intention behind this is to avoid uh, 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 like a, a point defense weapons, okay? This increases the sort of uh, viability of weapons over the course of the game here. And I'm gonna make a, put a few of them on the ship, maybe four. I think four will do. And now I'm going to fiddle around with the targeting um, radiuses. I'm gonna click on symmetric design here, just so what I do on this side will be copied on the, on the right side. Just to make the, my build time a little bit more efficient i'm going to set it like this that way we get a very wide angle of attack here but these two weapons can still fire at any target that's like in the middle you can't see the sort of um the firing angle but it is continuing on going through so it they will fire in the middle here it's still going on you just can't see it okay so we're going to set it like that that's pretty efficient as far as firing angles are concerned and we're going to kind of do the same right here okay so we're going to set it like this so this aims inward and same logic with here and same that inward so if you press arc I'm just going to get rid of these just to make it easier for everyone to see. You can see the weapon arcs right now. You see them, how they're overlapping. So these two missile launchers can shoot at any target that's in the middle. 
but they can also shoot over here not both of them of course but they they will be able to shoot at nearly 180 degrees while still be able to support each other right in the the eye of the needle here so i'm gonna put those mrms back because i like them and now i'm gonna get rid of arcs because it's kind of a mess to, to have so many arcs showing up you're gonna have that set up right there yeah that looks nice that looks tight wow that's a lot of uh, potential damage a lot of a lot of arcs right there but it's like fully covered in, in missiles now as far as the arcs are concerned so that's beautiful now let's see we need to have some anti-fighter support so what i think i'm gonna do is put in some shadow storms here shadow storms are going to be your anti-fighter missile launchers they fire a salvo 6 they have a very high speed they do home in on targets and they also have a shield penetration of 20 so whenever you see the shield penetration that means there's a 20 percent chance that the shots will penetrate the shields and hit the hull so fighters being fighters they have usually not too many sh uh, shields to go around and because there's a salvo 6 that means um there's probably a very high chance at least one missile will penetrate the shields and will do a ton of damage because the blast radius is quite high. So again, going back to just example of blast radiuses. So that's one that's uh, about a blast radius of like one. So it's around this this sort of range, you know, one, one, two, like somewhere around here like this. That's kind of the blast range. So that's pretty much encapsulating the, the whole entire hull size of a fighter. And that's quite a lot. Okay. So uh, you can't go wrong with shadow storms for anti-fighter capabilities. You can also see it has uh, quite a lot of um, a targeting radius or um, firing radius, I should say. So having multiple of these to like support each other wouldn't be a bad idea. Actually, what I'm going to do is do this. What should I do? Like this. Yeah, that works. So we go like this set that up like that that way these two uh, shadow storms can still support each other if our ship is aiming right in the dead center or there's an enemy ship right in the dead center and they still have quite a large firing angle same logic with the ones at the bottom set it like that and then these two can support each other at the bottom while still supporting these two so there's quite a lot of overlap here quite a lot of overlap so i'd say this is probably perfectly perfect coverage right now now what about some anti-missile capabilities well we have these missile point defenses here and as you can see already it does have a 360 degree firing angle so it can attack all the way around itself it doesn't really need to you don't need to play around with it too much actually not at all because it has a perfect uh, 360 fire arc right there it has a speed of 2500 which is very fast a range of 3500 damage of 40 blast radius of 6.25 which is massive and a salvo of two this is very strong it's actually quite strong for missile point defense um do i really need two of them though i could put one in the middle let's just put one yeah one is good one is fine yeah that looks clean i like that all right so i think as far as weapons are concerned i think that's quite sexy so now at this point why don't we add some power to power all these modules up and i think i'm gonna do it with fusion cores just to keep costs down i think um nine of them should do okay and obviously we're going to need engines just to get this bird moving um let's see capital warps let's do that yeah let's start with that just to see what's up and then we're going to use combat thrusters here just to help with the ship's turning radius because these combat thrusters these are mediums now two by twos they're a lot more focused on turn okay a turn of 180k that's not bad that's pretty nice and obviously we need to power these up so maybe there we go extend yeah that looks sexy so this is pretty do i really want no because I want to use these three these spaces right here for uh, bridges because uh, there's a new mechanic introduced by the uh, not combined arms by black box which is FCS accuracy so, oh sorry not accuracy FCS tracking so how tracking works is it, it, it's, it's very simple it, it it only can track a certain amount of targets so right now a ship's tracking is at one that means if it's if there's a bunch of enemies within range, it can only target one enemy at once. Okay? 
So if the ship gets surrounded by, say, like a million fighters and a million uh, corvettes, that sort of thing, it, regardless of how many turrets are like angled and within range, it can only target one, one thing at a time, right? So in order to be able to track the total amount of targets, you're going to have to get your FCS tracking up pretty, pretty high. So I'm probably going to give that example right now. It'll probably show that off. Let me just power this up right there yes 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 oh i think that's actually pretty good i think it only needs an fcs tracking of nine we'll see unless it sort of updates and it gives us sort of design uh issues here but i think we're pretty good it only needs an fcs tracking of nine so now what ends up happening is all these turrets can fire at any sort of target that comes within range here okay uh, fighters missiles anything it needs it can handle now i think that's pretty good now i just want to add some shields to this bad boy okay so what i like to do for my shields is i like to encapsulate the whole entire ship okay and the reason why i like to do that is because i i guess in sort of uh, sci-fi lore that's just how you do your ships you want the ships on the outside of the hull absorbing fire first before the hull itself takes damage and that's kind of how i do my ships for the most part so do it like this got quite a quite a bit of recharge at warp we have a lot of a lot of space to play with here as far as shields are concerned so we do this do this and uh do this and i think that's pretty good and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a couple more. Ooh, yes. A recharge at warp is at 98. Ooh. Oh, I do have extra space in the middle for an extra fusion power fusion reactor. There we go. We're back up at 100. That's pretty good. We could probably bring that down again by adding more weapons or or some other stuff. But we do need, <laughs> we do need some space here for um, actually for some... Um, actually need to reorganize this. Uh, need some space for what is it ordinance boxes because as we may imagine uh missiles do are quite ordinance hungry so we need to keep that in mind as well yeah, let's see can i oh not quite dirty bum oh yeah okay let's do this okay that's that's pretty good yeah okay so i'm gonna fill up the rest with ordinance just down the middle just to keep the ordinance boxes protected something like that so oh geez i deleted that put that back on there okay not bad that's pretty good we got a ammo time of 30 seconds that's not good enough at least one minute at the very least so what we're gonna do here is could make armored ordinance boxes just in the back here and that will give us one minute and just do this and then maybe just one box right there that may that i mean that does make the back quite vulnerable doesn't it i don't really like that uh, da, 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 da. let's use some cheap armor and i think i'm going to use steel steel is quite heavy but it does have a deflection uh, a pretty decent deflection so how deflection works is you can probably read it right there weapons which do less damage than this value will simply be defected by this armor due to its thickness so what does that mean so let's say okay i'm going to pick another weapon here let's say an energy cannon a simple laser pd cannon very simple so it has a damage per shot of 20 Okay, but let's say it's shooting at, say, uh, a large shield armor, okay? Let's say let's say it's shooting at this. Uh, it's on a turret. Let's just pretend. Okay, so I'm shooting at this. But because the large steel armor has a deflection of 40, that means that it will just deflect all the damage, all the damage coming from this laser cannon right here. So small caliber weapons, such as Vulcan cannons, that sort of thing, won't do really any damage to large, large armor blocks like uh, three by three right here. So it's a good idea to um, armor up your ship at, at some point, especially battleships like this one that I'm doing. So yeah, which I'm going to do right now, actually. And I'm actually going to uh, fill up, put those back. I might even mm, yeah, mm, put that like that. Maybe fix this just a little bit. Okay, I think that's good. Yeah, and then bring those shields up. Okay, do this quick. Yes. Yes, that's beautiful. I like that. Okay, 
and then we're going to put on our medium okay just like that it is more efficient just to use two by twos versus or, or three by threes depending if you have the space for it or not versus just saying oh i got three by three here let's just use a bunch of three uh, one by one blocks it is more efficient to use the larger sizes assuming you have the space for it than to use like the smaller smaller sizes so keep that in mind when um designing a ship that you want armor for unless you're using this empty space for like extra weapons or whatnot and i might even do that i might do that let's let's see maybe another weapon another missile actually i can't really do that like too many missiles <laughs> too many missiles you can never have too many missiles come on ah uh, no no it's imbalanced it's imbalanced if i add another missile i think this is a pretty strong ship for what it is yeah it's ship offense is at 5000 which is pretty significant already so i'm just going to armor it up at this point i think as far as its um defenses are concerned it's quite strong as it is so i'm just going to do this this and then we're going to get the small armor where are you right here right there right there and right there yeah, that's pretty tight. That's like, that's nice. Like that, like that. That should be an IO, I feel. That little block, it doesn't really need to be an I. That's just how I feel. And now, let's see, another large steel. Okay, good, right there. Then a medium, right there. And a small. And then we put another medium right here and then we have to just fill in that one slot right there with an eye with a with a in, internal bulkhead so internal bulkheads are pretty good i would recommend maybe using them to surround vulnerable nuclear reactors because they do have an explosive resistance of 30 percent which means they will just ignore explosive damage by well 30 percent so i do recommend that i might even replace these modules mm, i don't know maybe not worth it the cost the cost is one cost is 0.5 i could make yeah i could do that yeah let's do that just to make it that much more lighter because small steel armor it does weigh uh a, a lot more than say mass and it is a little bit more less costly so yeah we'll keep it like that we'll, we'll use that just to make it that much lighter so it can stay at ftl uh, have a higher ftl speed so let's look at the information here oh low target tracking this is what i was you know scared of so we have as you can read right here fcs target tracking has less tracking than the weapon facings okay it's deferring to how many angles or firing angles that we have going on so if we have say if, if i can actually fix this show this off for you if we have all our weapons just facing at the front okay just like this it will probably bring it down see so when it's talking about FCS angles, it's saying, well, you have so many angles going on, but you don't have enough like tracking data in order to handle all the angles that you have happening here. That's what it's deferring to. So in order to fix this, what you have to do is actually just add more bridges or command modules in order to fix that. So you can have all the angles, as, as many angles as you need. And I know how to fix this with just one bridge and that should fix that there you go off it goes so we have an fcs tracking of 13 with three bridge bridges and it's not a bad idea to put in multiple bridges because bridges uh quite interest uh, quite interestingly almost overpoweredly if i could if i could just show off the bridges uh, click on that okay there we go it has a shield amplification of 1500 so when powered this amplifies the maximum power of main shields in your ships this number is also divided by the total number of main shields main shields are dedicated shield modules that appear under the shield tab yep of course so you can see this on our shield strength it has that yellow font that yellow colored font that means that it's getting a buff from these bridges if we reduce these shields then that means the shields that are left would receive a greater buff because it's not the the power the amplification isn't being divided through uh, so many ways right 
So that's what that means there. So it's not necessarily a bad idea to just make a bunch of bridges on your ship, you know? That way you can get a ton of uh, shield amp support. You also get a bunch of EMP protection, power storage. Its range is at 40k, which is all right. You know, not amazing, but it's okay. Repair of, of 100, and we got three of them. It is accumulative, so that means modules will repair. Uh, if I can show that off again. Will repair at 100. Uh, HP per second when out of combat. So we have three bridges. So that's 300 total repair rate. That's pretty that's pretty fast when out of combat. And we have defense. So what this means is it indicates I'll just read it out. Uh, indicates the combat strength added to this vehicle or this ship versus boarding actions. So boarding actions mean when enemy troops board your ship. So this is kind of like boarding ship HP because each troop that boards your ship will start minusing the HP of your ship until a certain point. So this is like the, the boarding HP of your ship, as it were. And I don't think it's stackable if I think about it. I don't think this is stackable. I think in order to raise this defense up higher, you do need troop ships. Or sorry, not troop ships. Uh, da -da -da -da. Where is it? You need some small marine barracks. Like, can I just put you right there okay so that will increase the boarding defense of your um ship so uh, it's actually doesn't read anywhere i've actually noticed just noticed that it doesn't really tell you your bo total boarding defense oh huh. interesting very interesting however we're not worried about boarding because we're gonna blow them out of the sky before they even approach our ship so i'm not worried about that in the slightest so i'm gonna re-armor up our ship here Okay, and put that internal bulkhead back on there, and there we go, voila, we've made a pretty decent ship, uh, pretty vulnerable in the back, but we're hoping they don't, uh, you know, swarm us too much, okay? So now the last thing we need to do, set to conservative, and I think that's a good idea because around 80% for this ship would be like, like I don't know like like taking out a wing or something and once you take out a wing of a ship which is around 80% or even the top half it's pretty much on its way out like I've said earlier with the designing the fighter so setting up the ship to where it automatically goes back to base at 80% is probably the smart smart move overall so I'd highly recommend just setting your um your ships to conservative uh, kamikaze probably not a good idea I don't see a reason why you'd ever want your ship to kill itself that's just a waste of production anyways now we want to set to forward facing because what will happen is it will use uh, as we talked about earlier when designing ships uh, it will use the longest range uh, range of its weapon as its forward facing range so it'll try to stay at this max weapon range so it has a range of 10k this nuke so as an enemy approaches this ship and it's obviously capable of let me just show this off again Lo lots of things to show you okay let me go back da -da -da -da. tactical nukes as you can see it cannot target fighters or corvettes it can only target frigates and capital ships that sort of thing but once it does target a, a, a frigate or a capital it will stay at that range as much as possible at 10k so this gives us that much more time to to stay away from the enemy um uh, weapons which increases the ship's relative survival ability okay so that's pretty good i would think so yeah i, I actually quite i'm quite pleased of this ship so we have a sublight speed of 77 that's pretty slow i'll be honest but i think that's okay because this is a long range ship it's not even supposed to be like it's not a brawling ship uh, at all it's a long range ship Oops, you're here and clickety clack in the background. We have a turn rate of 10. That's not bad. I'm I kind of appreciate that. That's not bad at all. 10 turning at a 10 degrees per second is pretty good. An FTL speed of 15.58. That's that is quite slow, I will admit. But once it gets there, you know everything. No, nothing's gonna survive. <laughs> you know it's a, quite a strong ship. I'm actually quite pleased. So. I'm gonna save I'm gonna save now so we're gonna call it the D battleship okay battleship because I'm very creative with my ship names click save 
and that is that perfect so at this point what i'm going to do is i'm just going to press x just to close this screen and now i'm going to get in contact with the operatives that contacted us earlier so let's get into diplomacy now so here we are talking to the operatives now after having made contact with them the operatives are a race of cybernetic insectoids that have a strong tendency to want to invade other empires, taking over their worlds. They're kind of like the Borg in that respect where they just want to consume everything in their path. So on your screen here, you see some options, okay? And you see some uh, other information here on your left. This would denote the operatives' emotions towards you. So starting with trust, let's get into that and what it all means here. So trust denotes how willing an empire is to trade technology and plants with you and how likely the empire would like to enter a federation with you or an alliance. It can be seen as kind of a currency. Higher the trust means the easier it will be to trade technology with that empire. You can also gain more trust through gifts, such as giving technology or even entire worlds. You also lose trust when making unreasonable demands, such as requesting their home planet or being an aggressive empire, such as colonizing worlds in mass, colonizing worlds that the other empire claims to own, and having a high fleet strength. This leads to anger here. Basically, anger denotes how likely the Empire is about to go to war with you and how little it is willing to trade with you regardless. You can lower anger over time by giving gifts, not colonizing worlds that the Empire claims, not intruding on borders when you don't have an open borders policy with that Empire, or some cases, some races are just naturally angry regardless of what you do. So down to fear next. Fear grows from your military actions and overall fleet strength as well as successful conquests versus the empire in question. When an empire is afeard of you, they're more likely to make concessions such as a peace treaty. Okay, so that would be emotions in a nutshell. And then here on the right, we have some options here. We have declare war. Don't want to click on that unless you're for certain. There is no confirmation if you want to declare a war or not after clicking. Once you click on declare war, it's kind of a done deal. So be very careful you don't misclick. So down to discuss here. We have some options here. We can ask the empire whether it has any grievances with us, at which point it will give you know some feelings on us like whether it finds us way too aggressive or not very aggressive at all or any any in between that sort of thing just basic information there on how it feels and then you can even discuss how this empire the operatives feels about other empires if you like and then we have some blank information there that at feels like that's a bug i'm not sure why and then you have this computer program this is other fluff information uh, simulating our defeat very good and you can propose a federation okay and they'll probably say no because we haven't like um reached those requirements yet and now that's basically all there is as, as far as discuss is concerned but now let's get to negotiate now negotiate is going to be the meat and potatoes it's kind of the whole reason why you wanted to uh, make contact with another empire is to start trading technologies creating trade treaties non-aggression packs that sort of thing so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to do a little bit of a cheaty cheatiness in order to show off how to trade technologies with this empire so i'll be with you in a second so I've gone ahead and unlocked a technology that we'll be using for our sort of trading example here. So in order to trade, it's actually a simple matter of exchanging tech of equal or greater value. How it works is you want to select the technology you want to trade and I've unlocked energy weapons. So select that. Okay. And you want to compare that technology's value with the technology that you want to receive from the other empire. Okay, if the value of the technology that you're giving to the empire is greater than the value that you're receiving, so if I select Electro Armor here, so it's a lesser value than 180, it's only at 50 value, okay, then there is a high chance that you're going to be successful in the deal. If the value that you're giving to the empire is lower 
than the value that you'd be receiving, then there's a good chance that you may not be successful in the deal unless you have trust uh, with the empire. Okay, so other other factors are at play here as well. An empire is more likely to trade with you if they trust you also, and they're also willing to give more leeway in negotiations for that same reason. Again, so the opposite is true if the empire is angry with you as well. If an empire is angry with you, so they kind of are here, the operatives are angry with you, they may not want to trade with us at all, regardless of whether or not the exchange is equal or the empire is getting a better end of the deal in the bargain. So let's say, for example, again, just to show it off here, so we want Corvette construction because we're getting a higher value proposition here, okay, and we're giving them a lower value proposition because the values are different here. I also want to make mention here that the values that you're seeing here are coming from the research points. So uh, energy weapons cost 180 research points to unlock and thus their value is 180 so that this is where the numbers are coming from there it comes from the research screen okay so now i'm going to send this offer to the operatives okay so they got really angry there so if you noticed if you caught that the anger did go up a bit so now this is going to affect our future uh, trades with them because now they're feel feel insulted by the trade but if we try this again with a lower value, again going back to Electro Armor here, there's a chance they're going to accept it because Electro Armor is quite quite a low value sort of piece of armor, okay, and this is quite a high value uh, piece of weaponry. Okay, so now we're going to send the offer. We usually want to set it at uh, respectful, don't really want to plead or threaten, usually respectful is the way to go. All right, uh, and, and normally you generally, if you want to plead, they're probably, <laughs> will pleading work? Uh, it will work, but they're probably going to do that regardless, even if I was respectful. You don't really want to threaten, oh, you better give us the item or else, you know, they probably might get angry. Maybe you'll be successful with that, I don't know. You may want to roll the dice on that one. Anyways, so we have insufficient data points uh, to counterbalance counterbalanced by the profitable arrangement risk reward analysis except offer so this is a nice piece of information here at least from the operatives empire empire it's basically telling you uh we don't trust you very much but because we're getting such a profitable arrangement out of it we're going to accept your offer and that makes sense as far as like a business deal is concerned also you can trade planets as well and they operate under the, the same concept but as you can see there's no sort of numeral value and uh, how you sort of figure out the planet's value is basically common sense so you may have to do some research outside of the diplomacy screen here you may have to look into the, the actual planets themselves to see their value but let's say okay so this is seti 3 this is our home planet here and home planets and star drive are very high value items okay and let's say uh, uh Cicelone one is a very low value planet it has zero richness uh, zero population cap you know it it's a very low value planet if i sent this offer the operatives will be like oh this is a great world that we're getting and you're getting a pretty low value world in exchange of course we're going to accept this offer okay but let's say operatives one which I think is the operatives homeworld. If we were to send the offer, the chances are they're gonna not be they're not gonna accept our offer because that's their home world and it's a very high value world for them. So they're probably not gonna accept it. So you may have to use educated guesses there as far as exchanging worlds and trading worlds. You can also gift worlds if you feel the need to and by doing so regardless of even the quality of the world you'll gain very high trust with that race so that brings value to even barren you know poo poo planets as it were because you'll just gain very high trust with that race if you gift them and the how you gift a race is you just basically not uh, ask for anything from their part and just say and just give them something Okay, please accept our gift of the following colonies, and then that will probably increase our trust. I'm not going to click on that, but that's what would happen. Also, let's talk about alliances here. 
uh, alliances come from having three prerequisites established. You need to be non-aggressive with the empire, and they need to be non-aggressive with you. You need to have a trade treaty with them as well, and an open borders policy. Then after you have all three of these sort of acted upon, it will increase the rate of trust over time because at that point you're pretty much almost in a pseudo alliance already at that point. So now the trust goes up and up and up and up. And then at a certain point, you'll gain access to the option to start an alliance. This also ties into starting a federation. So we propose joining our empires into a federation. If you want to start a federation with an opposing empire, you're going to need to have pretty good trust with them. And that makes sense. And you need to be at non-aggressive, you know, have a non-aggressive pact with them, trade treaty and open borders policy as well. Okay. Uh, just touching upon artifacts as well, they kind of operate under the same philosophy as trading colonies. You kind of just have to use common sense here. Uh, for example, there are some artifacts that give 50% extra population growth, which is pretty impressive. A uh, very good artifact to have, I would think. So if you're going to be requesting, let's say they have this artifact. Okay, nobody has artifacts right now because it's early on in the game. But if they had an artifact that did get that, that uh, sorry that did give plus 50 percent population then you'd want to give them a pretty high technology to compensate we're like talking i'm going to give you mac drivers and that will be good for you won't it please give me your artifacts so you might have to consider that otherwise uh 90 percent of the time I find empires aren't willing to depart their artifacts because they are indeed artifacts. They're very good items to have. Okay, mostly most of your time here on uh, the d diplomacy screen is going to be trading basically technologies with each other or establishing non-aggression packs, trade treaties, and open borders policy. Okay, that's basically it there. But now you know i'd like to thank you all for watching this video and uh, you know it's been good to have you and oh my goodness oh no butterfingers we've declared war so we better get ready for war with this empire due to our slippery hands so let's prepare by setting up our fleet all right so here we are about to get started in making our fleet so to begin you just want to click on this little fleets button right here or hot key j as it tells you click on that you'll be shown this grid here and in order to start placing ships on this grid you want to click on first fleet out of nine either one of them will do but we're going to start with our first fleet here okay and now you'll be able to be uh, place your ships that you want because we haven't really made any combat orientated ships yet uh, we're going to be placing just some basic sort of uh, out of the box fighters uh, to start with for an example open up our little fighters bin right here and we'll see our fighters that we have access to and in order to start placing we just want to click on the fighter and you'll be seeing this little silhouette here and we can place it anywhere on the grid once we place it on the grid that fighter or any ship will now be in formation when we go to produce this fleet in a moment the fighter will be in the same formation as we placed it on the grid here so I'm going to place some more fighters just to show that off for you. So now, as I said, when we go to produce this fleet, they will be in this formation and they will always be in this formation henceforth unless we change it in the fleets screen. Okay. However, there are some things we can do here to these fighters. It's not just place the fleets and then off we go. We can actually change their behaviors. So starting with operational radius, okay, the priorities. Operational radius will tell us at what range the ship will start to automatically approach and engage the enemy high ranges would have the operational radius almost uh as you can see here the, the size of the whole entire solar system so it might be a good idea to even bring this down to something a little bit more bearable maybe uh, 40,000 or whatever but that's basically operational radius it's the automatic uh sort of target acquisition and starting to approach and attack the target so there's that so uh oop there's this little glitchy here i can fix this okay don't worry about that that's easily easily fixed anyways now we have target preferences here target preferences uh, very simply will tell us what kind of hull type that this fighter that we've selected prefers so for example this fighter's target preference is set to similar thus 
as you can see it will prefer to attack other fighters since it too is a fighter you can also change the preferences to something bigger than this ship or something smaller than this ship okay you can change the preference that is there i'll set it to a uh, similar though because for for fighters it makes sense for them to go after other fighters i, I would think to begin so and you also get these uh, little movement orders, these other behaviors here. So if you remember back in our little shipyard section, you could set the behaviors of your ship before you can uh, build it. It's just the same thing here, but found in the fleets. So I won't address that too much. Uh, uh, too much. So now to target selection here. Target selection, simply put, will target what it prefers amongst a horde of other preferred targets within this fighter's operational radius so for example if we set our target damaged weight to maximum okay and okay hold on everybody relax okay just a little bug just a little bug just a little bug so anyways if we set the target damaged weight to max what will happen is the fighter will then find enemy damaged fighters amongst say the horde of other fighters and target them over all others same logic goes for the rest here you can uh, give them different low weights and and really sort of optimize what kind of purpose you want for the fighter if you want right now because everything's set at zero everything is pretty equal no one's really um has that have really too much of a, a preference over attacking one target over another target there okay oh my goodness it's a little bug it's just a little bug okay so that's kind of how you can establish sort of target selection target uh preferences okay and, and uh, operational uh radiuses and priorities that sort of thing so you can establish the behaviors there now once you sort of established everything you set your formation you set the kind of ships that you want to place so you can now requisition your ships um, if we had ships already built, they were just floating around freely, we can assign those ships to this fleet, okay? Or we can click on build now. So build now will create a fresh batch of fighters using your planets that are best suited for the task. For example, it's more than likely that our home planet will be producing the vast majority of our ships because it is technically the best planet right now. And then rush now. Rush now will create a fresh batch of fighters using your planets that again are best suited for the task, but they will be just rushing and that will mean that we'll be uh, using all the production that will be dumped into the building of this fleet as quickly as possible. And that means if you're rushing, you'll be using up your treasury. So if you're suddenly are rushing a ton of uh, ships, that means pretty much all your treasury is going to be used up so be aware of that when you click on rush now i would never click on this unless you're prepared for it okay so and because again i don't have any fighters i'll be clicking on build now so once you click on build now the fleet will tell you where uh, your fighters and your ships are going to be built and as i said uh the vast majority actually all of them are just going to be built at 73 which makes sense Okay, so that fleet is being built. So now at this point, we just want to take the fight to the Operatus. So let's get into that now. All right, so here we are. We're about to invade the Operatus homeworld, and I do have a fleet available to do so. We have our D battleship and our D fighters for escort. So let's start moving them in. Actually, I'm going to tell my battleship to just hang out here for a little bit. I don't want to overwhelm the enemy just yet. There are some things I want to show off first gonna speed up the game time here for our uh, convenience okay slow it down just a touch okay so we do have some operatist ships now I'm gonna tell them to hold off okay there are some things I need to show off here tell them to hold off now da -da -da, take this you right click on that right click on that Okay, now let's unpause. All right, so how does ship combat work? So it works like any real-time strategy game. Okay, everything happens in real time. There's no turns. Okay, and like any other real-time strategy, you can left click on a ship, right click to tell it where to go. You can shift click to give it waypoints, that sort of thing. 
okay, like any real-time strategy. But what makes it different to other 4X games is the ship is made out of parts like we've shown off in the shipyard. So once I show this off here, you'll see, uh, you'll understand what I mean. So I'm going to tell these ships to start going into combat here. Okay. The DACA is real. Here it comes. And our sh shields are um, at being activated. They're absorbing those uh, kinetic rounds there. Okay. So when I press tab here, we can see an overlay of what's going on on our ships actually. So the shields have gone down. They're down to 30, uh, 30 shield strength. That's pretty much zero at this point. And as you can see, we are starting to see parts of our ship starting to be destroyed. And this is how we get our like overall survivability out of our ship here. Okay, this is kind of why I've designed these uh, fighters this way. To make something akin to that of like a low wall out in front to protect the more vulnerable things in the back. That was kind of my intention and this is why. So you can see our ship starting to get destroyed here due to that massive salvo of Vulcan cannons. Okay, and now it's pretty much dead at this point. Now and now those reactors are going to blow any second because now, as you can see, these little red markers denote the overall HP of the module. And usually, once the ship's overall HP is down to maybe 20%, it starts to really... Uh, <laughs> it, it probably is about to die, that sort of thing. And this is at 79, but because of the explosion radius, that's going to happen from this uh, nuclear bomb here that's on our ship. It's going to go kaput. There you go. So, that's how ship combat works in a nutshell. The eat each weapon will uh, do damage to a ship part and once the hp of that part is destroyed it'll just like it will bring uh it will open up vulnerabilities to other parts of the ship so if it's black that means any projectile coming through i'll show that off again okay so those parts no longer exist so now any subsequent projectile that come through will start damaging the parts behind it it's pretty simple that way now I'm going to bring some extra troops here. Sorry, not extra troops, extra ships. Because now I need to show off the sort of combat movement here. So how combat movement works, I guess just regular old movement. It works how you would expect uh, movement or combat movement in, in real life for like ship combat. So how it works, let's say I want these ships to go this way. Okay, like go over here. Okay, now I want them to suddenly go over here. Okay, so what will happen is the momentum generated by the thrusters of these ships will carry it forward still. Okay, and now it's turning this way. You can see the little thrusters starting to engage. And now the acceleration is happening. And now they'll start going that way. And they'll, if I tell them to do that, they'll start strafing. Start up uh, well, momentuming, sort of sliding around like it's on, like they're on ice, that sort of thing. So that's how sort of ship movement actually works. It's not like other forex games out there where it's you're kind of just flat, flying around like bees, uh, as it were. It's it, it's somewhat like a realistic isometric sort of system, if that makes sense. I'm hoping it does. So. That's basically ship combat in a nutshell and ship movement in a nutshell. So what about ship boarding? Let's talk about that. So ship boarding, okay, let's look at this drone interceptor here. Indicates the ship's current defense versus boarding actions. If the ship is boarded by enemy infantry and this number is reduced to zero, then the ship will be lost. And how we bring this number to zero is with troops. So let's gather our troops here. I do have troops inside our troop ships. And it's quite easy to get troops inside of troop ships if you want watched a previous sections of this video uh, you would know but let me just give a refresher course on it if you want to get a troop inside of a troop ship all you need is to have a troop idle on a planet let's just speed this through and then right click on the troop or launch single troop let's right click on that and then it'll appear and there you go you got your troop ship that's how you get troop ships in star drive so got a ship there Gonna move it in, and now I'm gonna grab maybe five of those and start. And I'm gonna make an attempt to board this vessel here, this tiny little uh, drone interceptor. Hopefully that works out. Ooh, actually that's.
Actually, I'm gonna have him try to fool him and have him face the other way so the troop ships will uh, not be in the line of fire. Okay, let's try to like do this smartly. Ah, where'd you go? Oh, geez. Did I take over? Okay, so I've managed to actually take over a ship. So you got this little sign here. You've managed to capture a ship. You can scrap it to get some research points towards your own hull and towards your own hull research of that type. Or maybe even unlock this specific hull if you're ready, able to build this type. So maybe we can do so there. As you can see, we have the troop ship, or sorry, we have the uh, drone interceptor, and we have the troops on this ship, which would be indicated uh, by the number four there. But because this troop can't technically, cannot technically support this many troops, we can actually get these troops back by sending it back to base. So let's do that. I'm gonna go to time six here. I'm gonna send this troop back. Oh, what happened? Oh, he. Oh, he actually let go of those troops. Huh. Okay. Well, why don't we just scrap this ship then? Okay. Da -da -da -da. We'll just wait until he gets back to the home base and then we'll right click, scrap him. We actually did get that troop back. There you go. There's a Dauntless troop outside of that ship right now. So there you go. And da -da -da. hold on, ship's array. Should be able to find you here somewhere. And we're going to click on scrap. Okay. And now, maybe, we will uh, get this ship hull. Drone was reversed to engineer during the scrap process. This hull can now be used to build our own ship. So let's look at that. Oh, what the? Oh. Hmm. That ain't the... Where are we here? Where are we here? So there it is. We can actually scrap enemy ships and gain access to their hulls. So we can do that if we so choose. We can customize it like we would any other ship. So you can do that with ship boarding if you so choose. Very fun. Very fun indeed. Okay. I'm not going to design a ship. We got other things going on. So now at this point, we just want to start taking over the Dauntless homeworld. It is time. I had enough of their shenanigans floating around in my space. My 100 acre wood? I don't think so. Okay. So as you can see, there's a big fight happening. I'm just going to let it play out at max speed. I'm going to actually tell, you, tell him to move in. Move in. There's the battleship. He's just going to go full ham on these fighters here. Alright, so we've taken over the sort of orbiting area of the, I guess, what do you call it? The, the LO? I don't know. The orbit, the orbit, the orbit of the Operatus homeworld here. So now at this point, we can start invading the Operatus world. All you need to do is grab your ships, and like uh, like we've shown off previously, uh, agree. I'll talk about you in a second. And like we've talked about previously, when it comes to uh, sending troops to other other worlds, it's no different here. Just select your troops, right click on the planet you don't like, or you can even tell them to invade. So. Tell them to invade. You click the amount of troops that you want to invade on a planet, let's say six, and they'll go and do so, like so. Hold fire. Okay, so now they're on the planet and they're doing a little bit of fighting here. Okay, so the AI is pretty good uh, as far as troop combat is concerned. Again, you don't. Sorry, I'm burping. You don't want to tell them to do anything. You just want to let it. Oh my goodness, I'm burping again. You just want to let it run on its own. All right, so we had our invading troops taken out, and that's because of the capital city, which has 40 HP and does 50 damage versus soft targets, soft targets being troops, and hard targets being tanks, that sort of thing, as well as this military outpost. So how do we solve uh, a situation like this where the defenders are well, well defended? Well, we can soften them up with a planetary bomber. Actually, we can probably use our, our brand new drone for an example, can we? Actually, we cannot, so we'll use this. So, the way you make a planetary bomber is you need, at the bare minimum, at least a tactical nuclear bomb bay. Just one will do, and now this ship will be capable of bombing enemy planets. So, let's just do this quickly. Okay, get some power. Get a cockpit going, very nice. Okay, get some ordnance. Okay, very good. 
Okay, now because I just want this to uh, go do bombing runs uh, on enemy planets, I want them to go to warp as quickly as possible to maximize that FTL time. Don't worry about this design error thing, it's not relevant, not relevant information, but this is a functional ship. So we're going to save it, call it the D bomber, D, D bomber, boomer, there we go, we're going to call it like that, very good. Okay, so this is ready to be produced. So we're going to go back to our empire, go to SETI 3, go to bomber. Oh, I have a, oops, I have a couple of bombers already. Oh, well. So we are going to make a bunch of bombers here. Okay, so we're going to rush through that. Scroll out a bit. We can also press this button if we so choose to scroll out. We don't have to use our mouse wheel. Those, there, there's the bombers there. Okay, we're gonna grab those and we're gonna go back to our base or sorry not our base the operator's homeworld and start bombing the crap out of them okay so how you tell your bombing ships to bomb is you select the ships with bombs on them and as you can see these little icons here would denote they're capable of bombing enemy planets okay select those ships and then you right click on the offending world and now automatically they'll be sent they'll uh, go to warp and then start automatically bombing the enemy planet like I'll be showing in a second here. Any second now. Any second. Any second. All right, so there they are. They'll begin bombing any second, as I've said, any second. All right, so they're starting to bomb. Let's just slow it down just to show it off here. There was the little nuclear bombs. Very nice, very nice indeed. And we can see what's going on by clicking on this little flag right here, ground assault view. Okay, so these bombs will have a very strong propensity to take out buildings and troops before anything else. However, there is a downside to planetary bombing. As you can see here in a second, we'll show that off. The planet's fertility will go down, and if you keep on bombing a planet beyond a certain point, uh, the planet's fertility will go down to the point where um, it'll be permanently, permanently infertile. It will never grow ever again. So be, uh, keep that in mind when bombing certain worlds. You may want to uh, not bomb them un unless you're planning on um, if you're planning on using them for food production. So keep that in mind if you're planning on bombing. So we're gonna let that do its thing. As you can see, the capital is going down, and we're probably gonna get this in the bag. So there you go. We've pretty much took over the Operatus homeworld. Well, not quite, because we still need to get troops on it and take it over officially. So let's get our rem remaining troops and then start start taking it over, because now the defenders are pretty much no longer able to defend. There's no, defen no, no defense going on there. Oh, they have a little outpost, but I don't think it's going to last very long here. And that will be that. Awesome. So we took over the Operatus homeworld. So, there's that. We've taken over the Operatus. They're no longer really a threat. They got little outposts and little colonies here and there, but I feel quite safe. So, why don't we talk about the threat uh, out east, which, is, which would be this sort of pirate base. So, let's talk about that now. All right, so here we are. Talk about NPC factions now. As far as NPC factions are concerned, there are three kinds, the Remnant Guardians, the Corsairs, and the Draugr. While Corsairs and Draugr are considered pirate factions and operate the same way, they will ask for payment when you initially make contact with them. If you choose to pay them, they'll leave you and your empire alone. However, if you choose not to pay them, they'll begin raiding your trade lanes and later on your worlds. They can even create mutinies on your own ships, defecting them away from your empire and joining the enemy pirate faction. You can stop mutinies from occurring by placing extra troops on ships, either 4 to 6 on cruisers or 8 to 10 on larger ships. Or you can even destroy pirate bases, upon which you'll gain credits for doing so while also lowering the mutiny chance. You can contact them at any time to renegotiate by finding one of their ships or one of their bases, like so, clicking on either their ship or their base, then pressing Q on your keyboard. Oh, where is it? There it is. Pressing Q on your keyboard and then contacting the leader. 
now right here we don't gain that option because they don't want to negotiate right now okay so that's basically the pirate factions as a whole the remnant remnant guardians however are a different story they are drones from an ancient race long ago they protect highly valuable planets and have access to high-tech weapons and shielding over time they can start attacking your enemy worlds you may want to deal with them However, as you deal with them, you'll unlock remnant technologies located in the secrets tab in your research tree. So, that's basically the NPC factions in a nutshell. Let's destroy this pirate base quickly. Oh, there goes my fighters, but don't worry, the D battleship is on its way. Where are you? Get in there. Get in there, child. Get in there, child. Nealfi's going to destroy this base right here. Should be pretty quick, thanks to the nuke. That nuke is quite devastating. Awesome. So as you can see, we did, we did indeed gain credits for doing so. So that is basically how you deal with pirates and pretty much the same way on how you deal with remnant. Now, let's talk about espionage. Let's really get into that now. So here we are at the espionage screen. It's here we'll recruit agents that will do dastardly deeds towards enemy empires ranging from spying to sabotage to robbery to inciting rebels and stealing technology of course. I've already gone ahead and recruited uh, agent for examples here and if you want to recruit your own agents it'll cost you 250 credits straight up and at the very start of the game you can only train a max of three. You'll also notice right underneath your little uh, empire portrait here, you'll get this shield with a number. This will denote your espionage defense rating. The higher the defense rating, the better your empire will be at defending against enemy spies. They'll work towards disrupting your worlds. You can increase this number in the following ways by recruiting more spies and by colonizing more worlds, which will give you access to recruit even more spies beyond the cap right here. Okay, you can also train the spies you currently have, give them some agent training. Okay, that will increase their level, and then that will go towards increasing your espionage defense rating as well. You can also research uh, certain research paths that will also increase your defense rating as well. In addition, when spies are idle, they will automatically be set on defense mode, which will uh, make them better at defending against enemy empires or enemy agents versus if they were constantly on an enemy um, or doing a mission against an enemy empire for example okay however with all that being said as your empire grows and you colonize more worlds your overall espionage defense rating will go down assuming you do not have enough agents to cover all the planets right it, it, hopefully that makes sense now when you send a spy on a mission against an enemy empire, a spy's level will be taken into account along with the enemy empire's espionage defense rating. Even though an enemy empire might have, say, zero defense against your spies, there is still a chance they might catch them. However, when a spy is successful in a defense counter spy mission, so they're basically defending against enemy spies, and they're successful in that defense they will gain a level for a maximum of three levels so if i go to agent training here it'll tell you at the bottom the agents can only go up to level three they can't go beyond that all right so why don't i show off an agent mission example let's just do something simple so you have an agent he's trained up he's ready to go so what you want to do just click on the agent, click on the empire that you want to target, and now you have access to these missions here. It'll take uh, a certain amount of turns to execute the actual mission, but it will also cost uh, credits up front. So if you don't have, like, say, 250 credits to spend, you will not be able to steal any technology. So keep that in mind. You can also repeat missions if you want. So if you just want a certain agent to constantly be infiltrating, for example, Okay, you can just automatically do that and it'll be very hands-off as far as um, agent missions are concerned. 
So why don't we do that? I think I'm going to do a simple robbery. It's pretty cheap, only costs 50 credits and take 30 turns and hopefully, actually there's a very high chance that we will be successful because their espionage rating is uh, minus eight for the operatives. They're pretty much wiped out at this point. So I'm gonna click on robbery. And now because it does take 30 turns, I'm just gonna speed through the footage and I'll get back to you in a second here. All right, so our mission was successful, as you can see in the right here, the, the sort of bottom right. So we did gain uh, 504 credits from the operatives. The agent was not detected. And because our agent was successful in his mission, he gained a plus one level. And if we go back to espionage here, he's now level two. And now we gain that extra sort of bonus to counter espionage, which is always very nice, I would think. So that's basically uh, espionage in a nutshell. You know, train your agents, send them on missions, put them on the defense to counter against enemy agents, and you'll do just fine. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for watching this super mega two hour and like what 30 minute tutorial. My god, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of effing crazy. So, I'd like to thank you all for watching. And uh, if you like videos like these and want to see other videos like them, be sure to like and subscribe. If not, I understand. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you. In the next one. Bye bye.